So, John, as I was thinking about this tonight, I was thinking about Bill Bryson, who's a travel writer. Some of you are familiar with him. He's a Midwesterner, made his made his name in, in England. And, uh, you know, he tapped in his Midwest roots in the book, The Lost Continent. And he wrote in that lead, I come from Des Moines. Somebody had to. Oh, yeah. So I was thinking with John that, uh, you know, he's done a lot of things, but uh, he could he could uh, start out his his book. I come from Madison, South Dakota. Somebody had to. Um, so let's get started. What was it like growing up in Madison, South Dakota? Well, I grew up on a farm about 10 miles south of Madison, um, but we were close to the town, so we had a lot of connections to it. I might add, since I'm in Wisconsin, the town of Madison, South Dakota was named by Wisconsin settlers who moved there from Dane County, and there were three beautiful lakes in that county, so they named it Lake County, and then they named the big town in the middle of the county, Madison, after the capital of Wisconsin. Um, since you mentioned Bill Bryson and travel and Des Moines, I should also say that this uh, trip got off to a bit of a rough start. Uh, I left Sioux Falls uh, the night before. I was supposed to have an event in Des Moines, and uh, I left early because a big snowstorm was coming. They were predicting 10 inches of snow. So I thought, well, I'll leave the night before so I'm sure to get to Des Moines to Ray Gun Books in, in time. Some of you may know about Ray Gun and his famous uh, t-shirts about the Midwest. Anyway, I got about two hours south of Sioux Falls and I pulled into a little town um, named Onawa, Iowa. And uh, since it was minus eight degrees, um, when I filled up the car with gas, I left it running, the keys in it, ran inside just to get a Mountain Dew real quick. I came out. This is a town of 1,500 people. This is not a big place. And I thought, it won't be a problem. Car was gone. So I called the sheriff, and he's there in like 20 seconds. And he's like, well, do you, do you know the um, driver's license or the license plate number on your car? I'm like, no, I don't. Um, and uh, he's like, well, I, we need some kind of clue how to get this car back. And I'm like, wait a minute. My wife has my, this phone tracking thing, and my work phone was in the car. So the sheriff calls my wife, pulls out his uh, phone, and they start tracking it into Nebraska. The car moves into Burt County, Nebraska. The, then the sheriff in Iowa calls that sheriff. And he was in bed, but he gets up and goes out and tries to get this car stopped, but it leaves the county before he can. Then it moves into Cummin County, Nebraska. That uh, sheriff didn't answer his phone, probably too late, gets into Stanton County, uh, and that sheriff answers right away. And he says, ah, I'll get out to the highway and my deputy's here and we'll see if we can stop it. So the deputy puts these metal strips across the road to uh, to blow the tires on the car, which I'm like, oh, great. That's not super helpful. But then the sheriff, uh, while the deputy's doing that, pulls the car over or turns on the lights and the perpetrator, perpetrator just pulls over to the side of the road, rolls down the window and says, sorry, sheriff, I give up. So he was a very nice Midwestern criminal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He didn't even change the uh, radio station. It was still on 80s on 8. And uh, I had a Canada Dry sitting there. He didn't open that. I didn't see anything move. But this poor guy. And then I went to get my car from the tow truck driver. And I went to pay him because they said it would be $200. And I went to pay him. He said, don't worry about it. You've had a tough night. See, it's the good country. It is the good. That's, that would be the definition of the good country. But back to Madison, South Dakota, it was it was a good little town. I had no complaints. And, you know, there's lots of I'm sure there's lots of Midwesterners here who come from small towns. They have uh, a certain rhythm to them. And there's definitely a sense of community. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of place where you leave the keys in the car and your car running in the winter because you don't expect much to happen. If you went downtown Madison, South Dakota right now in front of the bars, there'd probably be. 20 pickups sitting in front of the bar running 
just so they stay warm because you know that's that's the kind of place it is so um i was very lucky uh in that sense and my dad was a farmer and so i got interested in the whole question of um farm markets and are they fair and are the packers uh screwing over the cattle producers and the hog producers so i did a phd dissertation on antitrust issues and agricultural markets that's not a bestseller not a page turner i have a friend here from graduate school bert back there we were back in the trenches together at the university of iowa working on our phd at the same time um, he wisely chose more interesting topics than i did but um, that's how i got interested in history after the story ran, you know, the Q&A we did, uh, Jen McBride, a UW-Milwaukee emeritus professor, uh, contacted me, talked about the Midwest, and she said she used to teach a Midwest history course, and she would start off with a slide with a black hole for the Midwest superimposed over the United States, and that was her way of symbolizing the previous teaching and study, especially of the Midwest, especially when compared to the more popular historical regions of the South, the West, and the Northeast. So where did your interest in studying the history of the Midwest come from? Well, there's a very specific origin story that leads to this book. Um, and that is, I was teaching at South Dakota State University. This is the home of the Jackrabbits. This is not USD, which we were talking about earlier. And uh, by the way, the Jackrabbits just won the national championship in football. So people are bragging about that up in South Dakota. But this is a kind of classic academic story. I was in my office about three weeks before the semester was to start and the uh, head of the department came down, knocked on the door and said, hey, by the way, you're teaching the history of South Dakota this fall because all these education majors have to take this class so when they go out and become social studies teachers and stuff, they have some training in how to teach the South Dakota part. And I'm like, okay, well, so I kind of cobbled together a course, um, but there really wasn't very much good material. So I ended up writing a book about the settlement of South Dakota. So I had something good to use in that course. But one thing I noticed when I was doing that book is that 90% of the Americans who moved into Dakota Territory in South Dakota to settle it. Now, when I say Americans, I mean um, people who were already, um, you know, citizens, as opposed to this big group of immigrants that come over from Germany and, um, and Scandinavia mostly. So 90% of them are from the Midwest. And they're from Wisconsin, like my hometown. All these people came from Wisconsin. They moved in there and they named the, the town Madison. And this is true of lots of other places in South Dakota. So I wanted to be able to say something in that book about the original settlers, because there is this theory in geography and human geography called the doctrine of first effective settlement, which means a place takes on the characteristics of the first kind of dominant settlers to uh, to move into a place. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go read three or four books about the Midwest so I can explain to people what the DNA of these settlers was. Um, but I couldn't find any books about it. I couldn't find anything that was halfway decent summarizing uh, in a synthetic way the history of the region. So I'm like, this is very strange. And so instead of doing the book project I had planned to do, I went down this rabbit trail of why isn't there more Midwestern history? And I ended up writing this book called The Lost Region Toward a Revival of Midwestern History. And I remember a couple of people said to me, a couple of academic friends are like, nobody's going to publish this. Are you crazy? And I I got lucky. It was kind of a triple bank shot. I got a couple of good uh, peer reviews and University of Iowa Press published it. And so I thought, well, we need to have a conversation about this. And we had a academic uh, panel at a conference. There was no Midwestern history conference to take, take the conversation to. So we did it at a Great Plains conference, which actually was in Hudson, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, so we had this little discussion, probably 10 of us, and I sent out an email to the group. Hey, 
come to the bar after this, this uh, session and let's talk about what we can do to revive the uh, field of Midwestern history. And I thought a couple of my buddies would trickle in because I offered to buy drinks. So that usually you can get people that way. But like 35 people showed up. This was in Buckster's Bar in Hudson, Wisconsin. Anybody been to Buckster's Bar? Can't believe it. You're all Eastsiders, I guess, of Wisconsin. Anyway, it was a very good response. So we started having these meetings and listening groups, and we declared the creation of the Midwestern History Association, which has been meeting ever since. It meets every year in Michigan. Um, and we created every academic field, if it's going to be lively, has to have a journal. And uh, this is our journal, Middle West Review, that comes out a couple times a year. It's based at the University of South Dakota. And we're always looking for good submissions to kind of build the uh, field. And a lot of people will send us their academic articles and then they later on become books. Um, so that those two pieces of the puzzle fell into place, but then we still didn't have a book about the Midwest that you can assign in class, you know, something readable, something a couple hundred pages that someone can uh, use in a course and give tests over, et cetera. So I went to work on a survey history, synthetic history of the Midwest in the 19th century, which leads us to the good country. You claim 14 Midwest states, others say 12. And this stretches from Ohio to North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. Now we're in Wisconsin, that's in the Midwest, but defend those plain states in the Midwest. Well, I, I'm in the 12 state camp. So I'm in the camp of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Nebraska, where that guy stole my car. It's funny, that guy was from Omaha. And when I told these people in Iowa who did it, they're all like, sounds like a classic Nebraskan. <laughs> so yes, the, those 12 states are in. But there are various nuances you need to be aware of. Um, for example, southern part of Missouri is kind of southern oriented. I gave a talk in Springfield, Illinois, the other night at the Abraham Lincoln Library. And that southern tier of Illinois is very southern. You get down to Cairo, Illinois. I mean, that's further south than Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. That's way down south. Um, and there are parts of southeastern Ohio that's very much Appalachia. Um, so, but by the time you get to Columbus, Ohio's very Midwestern. Um, but to answer Bill's question, when it comes to the Dakotas and Nebraska and Kansas, you need to bisect those states. So roughly the hundredth meridian, um, the, the, um, the author Wallace Stegner once wrote a book about uh, John Wesley Powell, uh, which may ring a bell to some of you guys. He uh, famously declared the 100th meridian as this point, this geographic point that you cross and all of a sudden the annual rainfall drops below 20 inches. That becomes arid. It becomes short grass prairie. You have the slope up into the Rockies. It's it's more, it's a different topography. There's more ranching. It's, there's more Indian reservations. There's more geography, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of a different place. And so my state of South Dakota, where I'm from, um, these people who moved in there from Wisconsin, they recognized it as kind of uh, where, where their roots were from in Wisconsin. And so um, they, they had no trouble recognizing it as very much a part of the Midwest. But when you get two hours to the west of me and you cross the Missouri River, um, you are entering a new territory. And I would uh, commend to you, if you want to know a lot, of, a lot about this, and this is a pretty interesting debate, at least where I'm from, my part of the country, there's a book that was published by the Center for Western Studies at Augustana University called The Interior Borderlands, in which there's like 20 experts who go through why the roughly the 100th meridian 
um, the, the Midwest ends there. Before we go into the overarching theme, tell us about Hugh Hefner and Philip Roth's views of the Midwest. Might surprise people, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> well, um, I was in Chicago last night and uh, home of, I mean, Hugh Hefner like made his, started his big empire there. Um, well, I begin my book with a story about Hugh Hefner because it really struck me because I was working on this book and uh, I was driving out to the South Dakota Festival of Books in Deadwood, which is definitely the West. And uh, Hugh Hefner had just died. And so Terry Gross on her show, Fresh Air, on public radio played an old interview that she had done with him like 15 years before. And uh, she was asking him questions about where he grew up and how he grew up and stuff. And he said something like, well, my parents were typical uh, small town Midwest Puritans and members of the Methodist church. And then I thought he would go on to say how terrible they were and how repressive they were and backward and all this. Uh, but he didn't. Then he went on to talk about how nice his parents were and how much they supported him and how much they supported their community back in Nebraska. I'm like, well, these two things don't fit together. And so um, I just used that anecdote as a way to start talking about this stereotype of the Midwest as this reactionary retrograde place that's not worth studying. And you mentioned Philip Roth. The reason I put the story about him in there is that, you know, he was a true blue New Yorker. I don't think there's any question about that, but he was hired by the Iowa Writers Workshop. Actually, I think he was a true blue New Jerseyite. Well, Camden, right? Is that right? I mean, it's right across the river, very close in that area. Uh, um, but he, so he was, he married a woman from Michigan, uh, which if you read his, uh, biographical autobiographical writings and, and that new biography that's coming out about him, uh, he thinks that was a huge mistake. Anyway, she wanted him to move back there. He ends up in Iowa city at the Iowa writers workshop. He's completely miserable. And he ends up writing this essay for Esquire about how much he hates Iowa, which is pretty funny. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people I think would have that mindset on the coast. And that's why it's hard to get more books published about the Midwest, because, you know, publishing is based in New York and you got to uh, interest New York writers in these topics. And that's hard to do when they think of this place as flyover country where nothing happens. The, the overarching theme is in that first chapter with how the, mid, the 19th century Midwest stacks up, not against the rest of the United States, but against the rest of the world. Could you explain that? I think one of the most powerful things you can do as a, a historian or writer is provide comparative context to people. So since I'm writing about the 19th century, I wanted to give people a sense of what the world was like in the 19th century and why all these people in the Midwest were so excited about what they were accomplishing and how progressive they thought they were. Um, I was working on the beginning of this book and I, uh, I went ice fishing up in Northern South Dakota uh, and I went into this bookstore run by a retired debate coach. It's a huge bookstore in Watertown, South Dakota. It's a wonderful place. And I got this uh, old book about the history of Russia that I thought I would read if fishing was slow. And as I was reading this book, I'm like, my God, is there any place worse in the world to be than Russia in the 19th century? And, and then, so I put a couple paragraphs in the book about that. And then I thought, well, let's do some more comparison because obviously Russia is uh, very dark. Um, you know, it has its own um, particular darkness. So then I included chap or, uh, paragraphs about Japan and China and Brazil. And then I went to England and France, et cetera, just to show to readers that no one else was had universal manhood suffrage in the world at that time. There were very few places, places that had guaranteed civil rights. 
there were very few places that had constitutions and uh, open court system that people could try to enforce and seek their rights through. Uh, there weren't places that had uh, progressive foundational charters like the Northwest Ordinance that governed their lives. Um, and there weren't places that, you know, um, progress was being made on the fronts of gender and race, et cetera. And I just wanted to get that across to people uh, because think about these uh, immigrants who are coming into Wisconsin and other Midwestern states. I mean, many of them, Wisconsin's known as a big German state. Um, the, most of these German immigrants were leaving uh, principalities in Germany that were completely controlled by the prince. And there was no debate about what your religion would be. You followed the religion of the prince and there was no guaranteed civil rights and you weren't voting. And so they were happy to be here. I hesitate to ask this question because it's probably like asking the infield fly rule explanation. But what is the short version of the importance of the Northwest Ordinance? <clears throat> I know. A couple of things. Number one, it made clear that when you set up a state in the new territory out in what, what became the Midwest, <coughs> everyone was to have guaranteed civil rights. Now this came prior to the constitution and the first amendment and all of those rights being guaranteed nationally. Uh, so people forget that the Northwest ordinance preceded that. Um, it made clear that you could worship whatever religion you wanted to. And again, this made our region different. In New England, that really wasn't the case. The congregational church had a hammerlock on the culture of New England. In the South, it was the Episcopalian or the Anglican Church, which dominated. But here in the Midwest, you had this huge mix of religions, which we should talk about a little bit more because it's important. But to get to your um, question about the Northwest Ordinance, the other thing it did, it allowed new states to be created. You weren't just going to be appendages of Massachusetts or Virginia. And so pretty soon you could have your own elections and choose your own uh, governors and, and uh, congressmen, et cetera. But the big thing that it did is it banned slavery in the new Midwest, made the Midwest a completely different territory. And so above the Ohio River, all of these states um, adopt all these rules and constitutions prohibiting slavery. We're on the other side of the Ohio River uh, slavery was, you know, a part of everyday life. Uh, when de Tocqueville went down the Ohio River, uh, he made these comments like, uh, to the left, you know, you can see a thriving uh, new society. On the, on, the, on the right, you have a thriving new society. On the left, you know, you got Kentucky and slavery, and, um, and it's not very progressive. How did they weave together what you call this dem co this common democratic culture that included civic society, the arts, churches? How, how was this all woven together in the Midwest? Well, when people would get here and they would begin to form a settlement, they would often uh, form a couple of churches. They would organize a main street. They would... Uh, raise new buildings for the early commerce of the period. They would build a schoolhouse. Uh, education was extremely important, also mandated by the uh, Northwest Ordinance. Um, so by the middle of the 19th century, 90 plus percent of people in the Midwest were literate. And they, they, um, they very much created a culture of book reading and writing. And there were ma many major publishers here in the Midwest uh, supplying that desire for books. And um, they also started to build colleges immediately. Uh, and by the 1840s, there's 20 colleges in Ohio. And in, here in um, you know, Wisconsin, you begin to see colleges like Ripon College, et cetera, organized. Now, compare that again to the East, 
Massachusetts has two colleges and South Carolina has one. So that shows you uh, how society differs out here. Um, they started having elections right away because they had universal manhood suffrage and 80% of people would uh, vote in many of those elections. And this is not, it's not easy to vote back then. I mean, you had to um, get the wagon hooked up and go into town and vote. I mean, this, this wasn't like mail-in voting where it takes two seconds or whatever. So this, this is impressive. And um, you have high turnout uh, in these elections and um, you begin to see um, a very strong civic culture and the beginning of civic institutions like uh, some of the bigger cities organize operas and there's obviously all these civic clubs that emerge. Um, the Midwest is the heartland of civic clubs like, you know, Kiwanis and Lions and Gideons and all those come out of the Midwest. So um, it's a very healthy civic culture. Obviously all was not sweetness and light in the Midwest. And you have a chapter in which you discuss how the, you, you and the Midwest actually, you're coming to grips with this racial history that's both good and bad. There's racial restrictions, severe racial restrictions. There's abolition, what you call abolitionist activism. There's also the spark that leads to this, uh, a spark that leads to the Civil War, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So can you reflect on this jumble of things that are occurring in the Midwest in this period? Yes, this is, uh, so I wanted to deal with uh, the dark side of the Midwest very specifically and open, openly and thoroughly. So I think it's the third or the fourth chapter I dedicate entirely to the question of race. And um, in the early days of the Midwest in Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, because those are the first states that begin to fill in and begin to be organized, uh, there is the adoption of black codes, which these are statutes that prevent African Americans from voting, from testifying against whites in trials, and um, what is the other thing? But, oh, you have to be bonded. So if you're in, say, Ohio and you're African-American, you have to show papers showing that you're free black, not an escaped slave from Kentucky, probably. And you have to be bonded, which meant that a couple of people had to vouch for you. And if you broke the rules or cost the county some money or whatever, they would have to pay for it. Now, this is a little different in the northern parts of the Midwest. There aren't uh, as many, or in some cases, there aren't any black codes adopted in uh, Michigan and, and Wisconsin and Minnesota and the Dakotas. It's a little bit different mix of things because these southern, these southern tiers of Ohio and Illinois and Indiana, there's a lot of southerners coming in there first, whereas in Wisconsin and Michigan, you get a lot of New Englanders first and Scandinavians, so it's a little different mix of, uh, of voters, et cetera. So big parts of chapter four are dedicated to explaining all of these many racial failings in the Midwest in the early decades of the, 20, of the 19th century. But that's not the end of the story. There is... And this is where I was sort of surprised at what I found when I began to do this history. There is a rather rapid uh, succession of events and reforms that begin uh, to change and um, rectify these early mistakes in the region. By the 1820s, uh, or I should say the 1830s, many of these new colleges in the Midwest are welcoming African-American students. In Ohio, there are 120 schools, K-12 schools organized for Af African-American students by the 1840s. I didn't expect to see that. I didn't expect to find that. By 1850, there is about 40% of African-Americans in Ohio who are uh, literate and being educated. 
Uh, I thought that was a higher number than I would have guessed going into this project. So think of it this way. There's a higher percentage of African Americans in the Midwest being um, educated and becoming literate than there are white kids in the South. Because in the South, there's no money, public money being put into public education. It's not taken seriously there. Now, if you're part of the planter elite, planter aristocracy, your kids would be educated. But the common school system was uh, extremely weak in the South. So I, uh, there, there's also many examples, which I didn't expect to see, of African Americans voting in Michigan and Ohio. One of the reasons I mention Ohio so much is Ohio was the first state in the Midwest. It becomes the most populous, and it kind of becomes a trendsetter. And when it starts to fill up a little bit, those settlers move into these other uh, states to the West. Um, Today is the birthday I saw on Twitter of Langston Hughes. And I found out that it's the grandfather or the father. It must be the grandfather of Langston Hughes uh, was voting in Ohio, in Lorain County, Ohio, in the 1850s and 1860s. And he was elected to, he was elected county recorder of Lorain County, Ohio. Again, not not something that's well known. Um, now, the, the other thing that needs to be taken into consideration here is how quickly abolitionist societies took root and expanded and grew in the Midwest, starting in the 1830s. And they became extremely powerful. And they began to change the politics of all these states. Wisconsin's a good example of this. Uh, the abolitionist story involving Joshua Glover. Do people know much about this? Is this a well-known story here? He was a slave in Missouri who uh, escaped and made his way to uh, Racine and uh, was there a couple of years working uh, in some capacity. And I think his um, the person who claimed him as his property from Missouri showed up. And um, this was after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. And so he expected Wisconsin people to help him recapture his slave. And uh, I think the sheriff of whatever county Racine is in said, well, this is, the, this is the law. So put him in jail in Milwaukee, I think. And then a thousand people gathered outside of the jail here in Milwaukee, and went in, rushed the jail and the jailers, and captured Joshua Glover and set him free and got him to freedom in Canada. Um, and, you know, that's not the end of the story either. The guy who led all of this, uh, help me, well, Sherman Booth, the, the editor, abolitionist Sherman Booth, um, he gets prosecuted for violating the um, the federal, the Fugitive Slave Act, but the Wisconsin courts would not cooperate with it and tossed it out and said, we don't recognize the Fugitive Slave Act. We think this is unconstitutional. Uh, then the Supreme Court in D.C. said, which was dominated by Southerners, uh, you know, denounced what uh, Wisconsin did and said you had to follow the law, and Wisconsin still refused to do it. So that's a good example of how this abolitionism swept through the Midwest. And uh, the other thing is, Bill mentioned the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This was passed in 1854 or so and made it possible for slavery to spread into the Western territories, into Nebraska and, and other territories where, according to the Missouri Compromise, it was not supposed to spread. So this set off a huge chain reaction uh, major blowback to the passage of this law, maybe the most uh, intense blowback to the passage of any national law in American history. And all of a sudden, people began to organize and they created a new party. Ripon, Wisconsin was the scene of the creation. I mean, there's some dispute. Is it Crawfordsville? 
Iowa? Is it, uh, what's that town, Jackson, Michigan? Or is it Ripon, Wisconsin? But it's one of them. And all of a sudden, this new party uh, in spreads incredibly fast. And so by two years later, they have a presidential candidate, John C. Fremont, who wins all these states in the Midwest. And then the Midwesterner from Illinois that we all know, Abraham Lincoln, wins uh, the presidency and sparks the Civil War because the South is not going to stay in the Union under Lincoln. Um, so the war begins and uh, people start sending troops. Wisconsin sends the Iron Brigade. There's a great book about the Iron Brigade, uh, probably available in this bookstore. I encourage you to read it. Um, but it shows um, the devotion and the sacrifice. I mean, these, this brigade took a ton of, I don't even remember what the casualty rates were, but they're through the roof. And 91,000 Wisconsinites went off to fight in the war. And this is when Wisconsin was not a huge place. 91,000 people is a lot of people. So um, the war ends, uh, the South is defeated, and the Midwest begins adopting these Civil War amendments, and they're all passed by popular vote um, in places like Wisconsin. So we adopt these amendments, abolishing uh, slavery and extending African-American suffrage, et cetera. Um, and civil rights laws are passed in the Midwest in the 1860s and 1870s, saying there can be no segregation on public transportation or in hotels or et cetera, et cetera. And uh, remember at this time, this is when Jim Crow is being rigidly enforced and created in the South. Um, they're going in totally different directions, uh, these two regions. So, I mean, th there's a lot of things that the Midwest did wrong in the beginning of the mid of the 19th century, but there's also a lot of things they did right by the end of the 19th century. I was going to ask specifically about the Civil War, which of course was the defining moment of the 19th century in America. Um, it, it helped shape and mold this region as well as the country. It helped give it its identity. Is it is it the and without Lincoln and without Lincoln's generals, the Union might not exist. Do you, is the Midwest the, the 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 great change agent of that period that that enabled the Union to win? I think it can be reasonably argued that without these Midwestern states and the men and material they supplied that the North would have lost. I mean, Lincoln, at the beginning of the war, uh, he was so frustrated because these generals in the East kept floundering around and losing battles and going backwards. And he was so relieved that out in the West, which would be the Midwest, General Grant out in Illinois, and his right-hand man, William Tecumseh Sherman from Ohio, and, and dozens and dozens of Midwestern generals. I think there were 50 Midwestern generals from Ohio and another 40-some from Illinois, and I'm sure there's some from Wisconsin, but I, I don't know the exact number. But Grant took his troops and started marching south out of Cairo, Illinois, and marching through Kentucky and Tennessee and winning battles and taking control of the Mississippi River and, and change the course of the war. And Lincoln finally says, I want that guy out here in charge of all my armies. And so he puts him in charge of the whole uh, Union operation. And Grant sends Sherman down to burn the South until they give up. And um, if, if not for the Western theater, and if not for all the Confederate troops that were pinned down out here because of um, these Midwestern armies and regiments, um, I think it would have gone in a different direction. The other thing that's interesting about the Civil War is that these regiments are organized by region and state, like the Iron, Iron Brigade. You know, that's mostly Wisconsin guys, but, you know, they get so beat up uh, in some battles, they end up having to be reinforced with troops from other, like the Michigan, a couple of Michigan regiments end up joining. But um, so that really kind of reinforces the regional nature of the war, because you're 
and you're going to fight with people from your town. You're signing, signing up with all your buddies. Um, I remember reading the college in Michigan, um, what's it called? Uh, Hillsdale College. They shut down the campus because all the, all the students marched off to war. And that's true of a lot of other places, a lot of other towns emptied out. Um, so yes, I think it's safe to say um, that you know the Midwest was was the key to the outcome of the war. Oh, one other thing on Wisconsin, think about Wisconsin. Not only did it supply ninety one thousand troops, but Wisconsin first people who moved in here they were mining lead, and what do you need in a big war? You need a lot of lead back then. And you have lots of trees that were shipped down the rivers to make uh, stocks for rifles. And Wisconsin was number two in wheat production at the time of the Civil War. And all that wheat gets made into bread and fiber for or bread and uh, food for uh, these Union troops. So huge difference. What was the role of college education in the Midwest during this period, both opening doors to others, including uh, many men, African Americans, women, sorry to lump it all like that, but it was a great door opener for women during this period. And how did it affect what occurred in the Midwest with the growth of these colleges? Yeah, the, the dedication to the creation of colleges and the funding of them is really, really impressive. And um, I wish I could have done a book on it by itself, because it's a great topic. There's a historian named Kenneth Wheeler who's done quite a bit of work on this if you wanna really get into the details. Um, and those are all private denominational Christian colleges. And then comes this era of land grant colleges. Because remember, when the South secedes, all these Southerners leave Congress. And so um, the Republicans are able to pass things like the land grant, um, land grant education bill which was always blocked by southerners and when they're gone he passes that and so it leads to the creation of places like you know michigan state and madison and uh um, urbana champaign and university of minnesota and south dakota state etc um so that's very important but you kind of hinted around about the uh, i kind of talked about african americans being allowed into many of these colleges uh, which is an amazing story in and of itself, but the co-education of women, meaning women could go to college just like everyone else, that is created in the Midwest. These, edu these colleges like Oberlin and Ohio University and Miami and um, Antioch, et cetera, they're co-educational. And um, many of the women who go to these colleges end up becoming civic reformers and heading up civic reform groups. And also they begin to pressure people to extend the suffrage to women in these Midwestern states. Now we all think about 1920 when women get the right to vote nationally, et cetera, but there's a lot of steps that go into that. In the Midwest, women start asking for the right to vote and they start being, they can start to vote in municipal elections and local elections and county elections and school board elections. And um, pretty soon the rules are changed where they can run for office. And I, I remember a, um, a young woman gets elected mayor of this town out in Kansas in the 1860s and, um, and then they're clamoring for um, being allowed to join the Bar Association and become lawyers. All that happens in the Midwest too. Um, Harvard didn't allow women into Harvard Law School until 1950. But this is going on out here in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, so that's, that's impressive. And there are other offices they're able to be elected to like, um, and they're able to become like notary, notary publics. Now, that's not a big office these days. But back then, that was like being a pseudo lawyer. Uh, it was an important part of the court system. Um, and that, that, that was open to them uh, back in this era too. Um, 
there's a cover story in Middle West Review, I think it's two or three issues ago, and it's written by a historian at Hamlin College in Minnesota. This is the college making all the headlines now because the president has uh, made a lot of blunders, shall we say. But she wrote a great piece about how co-education is a uh, Midwestern phenomena. The, obviously, Lincoln is the indispensable person of the 19th century, but I want you to, if you could, to talk about William McKinley, who maybe reflected the 19th century in his life more so than most anyone else. Yeah, William McKinley kind of ends my book. I think it's a good bookend uh, because I had to cut this off somewhere and I decided like 1900 seems about right. Uh, that's about a century of uh, history. Uh, but he's one of these classic Midwestern figures from this era. He grew up in a little town uh, in Ohio and he uh, was very successful in the local academy or the high school. And uh, of course, he becomes an abolitionist and he um, starts joining all the local clubs like the Lions and the Rotary and the Masons and whatnot. He joins the Union uh, cause in the Civil War and um, becomes an officer and goes home after the war and becomes a lawyer and gets involved in politics and becomes governor of Ohio. Um, if it seems like when you're reading this book, um, there's like 35 guys who are union generals from Ohio who become president, uh, then the point has been made, I guess, because there's a lot of them. Um, but then, uh, and he's very successful. He wins all these Midwestern states when he runs for president twice. But then he's killed by an anarchist at the, uh, at the beginning of his second term. And it just seemed like the right way to kind of put a bookend on this book. It's it's the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a very violent century, a different century. The Midwest begins to change in profound ways. It becomes the more industrial and uh, less agrarian and more urban, et cetera. Um, and that that is a whole different topic that hopefully I'll be able to tackle someday. Let's wind up where you wind up. Uh, you specifically declare it's time to fill the massive hole in the middle of American history. How do you do that? Well, think of it this way. In the late 19th century, the biggest region in this country is the Midwest by population, manufacturing capacity, agricultural heartland. Um, this is the pace setter region. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, Ohio is almost three times the size of California. Wisconsin is bigger than California at the end of the 19th century by itself. Um, this is where the action was. And if we are teaching American history and we're not giving some attention to this huge region, the biggest one in the country, and all the things that are going on here and all it's accomplished, then we aren't fairly rendering the accurate story of the American past. So we definitely cover in our classes the history of the South. Obviously, we obviously cover New England. They love to tell their own, toot their own horn, and they have kind of control of the publishing industry. So they, you know, they get a lot of attention. And the one of the biggest boom fields boom areas in history in the past 30 years has been the history of the American West. It's a huge field and it's very fun. I kind of started off in the West because I love that topic and half of my state is Western. So it kind of makes sense, but the Midwest gets left out. It's the lost region. So help us find it again. Thank you. John, John was great. And I think Given his storytelling ability, it may be a very long autograph session. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bill. Thanks to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and lending us, Bill. This was great. Thanks for giving us some attention.